Hi everyone and welcome to Adobe Live. I'm Flynn, uh, host for this afternoon, and I'm joined by illustrator, artist, designer, teacher, everything else, Jeremy Lord. Yeah. Hey guys, good to be here again for day two. Yeah, um, so jump jump into chat. I can already see Henry and Henrique in there, Silva, nice to see you. Um, we're going live from Sydney, um, but yesterday we had people from uh, Wellington, New Zealand, New York, Moscow, uh, Mumbai mm -hmm. as well, uh, which was super cool. So we'd love to find out where you are because we're going live on Behance at a pretty odd time, I think, around the world. Um, but it's great to have you here. Um, so what we thought we might do is do a bit of a recap of what we did yesterday. Yeah. So this is part two of how to draw a manga character with Jeremy Lord. Um, and why don't we have a look at, yeah, where you're at, where we're at today, and we'll give people a recap in case they weren't here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so how to draw is sort of like a, a manga character. Which is, I guess maybe more accurately how to draw a character in manga style. It's just not right. technically a manga character. But it's hard um, to make a title out of Yeah, of that a little bit. YouTube, it's a little you know? bit of a, a mishmash of all the different styles. We kind of talked about this yesterday. But uh, essentially what we went through um, yesterday is we kind of um, talked a little bit about... Uh, hang on, and I've lost my train of thought. Um, I, I basically started from scratch, right? Yeah. Like, or semi-scratch. Um, where you guys gave us a brief, which was to kind of work in something around the Chinese um, New Year and the Year of the Rat. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a little bit of kind of research, found all these images. So yesterday we kind of spoke a little bit about that and sort of how do you communicate ideas, what do you research, the amount of reference that you take to do your artwork and how to pick and choose those um, in order to create... Uh, an artwork, and so we went through basic sketching mm. ideas, um, how to create a semi kind of pencil brush in Photoshop, uh, and effectively then just landed on this um, character. We went through a, a couple of different poses um, and pretty quickly moved on to this. Um, and then, yeah, basically just talking a little bit about, you know, making these mistakes, uh, trying to, to fix them, got to fix those mistakes. We talked a little bit mm -hmm. about murdering your darlings yep. uh, and landing on this final sketch. So for those of you guys who were watching yesterday, you might be looking at this one going like, hang on, I don't remember all of these things. Um, so full disclosure, uh, I went home yesterday and added stuff to it. There were still cool. a few things that were bugging me with this. Um, the rat sitting on that little kind of Game Boy was uh, pissing me off a little bit. Just right. couldn't get him to work, so fix that. Um, I've added a Chinese lantern, and again, pretty sort of stereotypical, but those are the things, you know, like stereotypes exist for a reason. They're the things that the most, like the broadest possible audience are going to recognize as a certain flavor, a certain look. Yeah. Um, so if you're going for that, then, you know, don't, um, don't neglect a stereotype simply because it is, it has been done to death. Yeah. Um, yeah, also, we're talking about that visual that visual language and yeah. people understanding, oh, okay, I, I get it. There's a Chinese theme here, Lunar New Year. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, I think what's important here as well to remember, if there's anything to take away from yesterday, is I think don't, um, don't necessarily go like, oh, yeah, I know what a Chinese lantern looks like, and then just draw that. It's right. important to still go online and look, there's a bunch of different shapes for them. Um, and even the one that you think you want to draw, you might know exactly what it looks like. So yeah. important just to, like, if you're going to do it, do it right. Um, and even referencing the sort of the human pose, we talked about the difficulty of drawing hands and um, how I would sometimes, and quite, that meant quite often, mm. take a photo of my own hand in the pose that I needed and then yeah. use that as reference. Yeah. And using Don't your partner as a muse yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. That's what partners are for. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, like, Make your make your life a little bit easier, and don't you don't have to draw everything from memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. And I liked as well. I think yesterday something something we covered um, was sort of a part that was kind of giving you a bit of trouble is sort of just going away from the main composition um, and getting in there and like really focusing in on on that hand or the rat that you fixed up yesterday, yeah. and then kind of erasing what you'd already done and then putting it in, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. It's like the illustrated version of just going for a walk and then coming back. And just and kind of yeah, fixing. exactly, yeah. And, and we talked a little bit about liquefy to kind of fix different aspects mm. of the drawing without having to redraw them completely. So mm. all these tools that, like some, and we might look at one today, the symmetry tool that in in some circles is kind of looked upon as sort of that's cheating. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll address that a little bit. But today uh, is essentially going to be about inking. Yeah. And so I'm going to talk about how to get go from the sketch to a nice clean line. Uh, and we'll touch upon color as well and start coloring this up. Awesome. 
Excellent. Right. Great. Well, I can see some people having a chat in the chat, which is which is awesome. Hey, hey, Festus. Hey, Collie. Yeah, it's, it's funny, actually. So I'm wearing a Jeremy, Jeremy Lord original. It's yeah. a Goro's T-shirt that I think you gave me last time you were on the live stream. Um, which is great. That's the bar for any people out there that want to come on the live stream. You have to give me, you have to give me swag. Should be the other way around. Um, so yeah, this is a Jeremy Lord original, yeah. and you're actually wearing, and I'm wearing a Jezrai original as well. So yeah, also a regular on um, the Adobe APAC um, live stream, which is super cool. So keeping it in the family here. Um, but yeah, hey, hey, Collie, um, Collie, and uh, and Festus and Henrik in the chat. Um, feel free to ask questions as we, as we go. I think you've got a lot to cover. Yeah, today. we've got a, a fair bit to get through, and mm. hopefully we'll we'll get there towards the end. But mm. yeah, absolutely, drop some questions in. That's that's the the level of multitasking to the max that I can do is draw and talk at the same time. Draw and talk. You can't chew gum. Um, no, so <laughs> no gum, and I'm not walking either. So that's good. Um, so yeah, so let's get stuck in. Uh, so I've got the sketch. Um, we talked a little bit about yesterday about why I'm using blue pencil, um, mm -hmm. and obviously a little bit of pink in there just because. Those are my colors, but the blue pencil is there just to kind of act as a as a lighter sketch that's not going to get mixed in with the black. Um, but what I still do at this stage is I'll grab like there's a, a a bunch of different layers in here. There's the main sketch again; they're all they're all named, which is pretty important. Um, different things like that. I could merge these all down, but why would I? It's a little bit destructive. So I'm going to select all of those um, and then hit control G and that's just going to group them all in one yep. neat thing. It's just going to clean up my layer palette a little bit more. It's also going to allow me to drop the opacity on all of those at the same time without having to do it to a bunch of different layers and a slightly different opacity on everyone. So mm. grouping them all together and then just drop the opacity. And also because when you're in the thick of it, it's, it's one of those things that happens on, um, that you'll see on Designer Humor on that Instagram account quite a bit is just like when you work for half an hour and then you realize you've been working on the wrong layer this whole time and right. it's just like, no. What's that? Designer Humor? Yeah, Designer Humor is an Instagram account that just takes memes and wraps them up into designers. Oh, I'm going to check, gonna yeah, have to check that out. It's right. usually pretty on point. So <laughs> I'm actually going to lock this. And what that means is that Photoshop's not going to let me be my usual stupid self. And it's going to say, no, Jeremy, you can't draw on this. This is Jeremy proof. From, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I'll just draw oh, not a, diff, a new layer, a, a new layer, not a new group, sorry. And then I could call this a bunch of different things. I usually call this, this is my code for outline. I just use OTL. Um, if I was handing over a file to another designer, and we'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, mm. I'd use different naming. But if it's just for me and I'm just going to, print yeah. it or sell a print or whatever, I know that that's um, outlined. There's also a thing that you can do if you really want to start looking at sort of labeling your layers a little bit more is add a color to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just by right clicking on it and then going down to select that color. So that just lets you know, like at a you know drop of a hat, what you're looking at. Mm. Um, but yeah, so let's get stuck in. I'm going to use a basic brush, and if you remember from yesterday, I spoke about um, a couple of things where you could download brushes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to use this guy's brush. Um, this is Frendon. Again, we went there yesterday, um, and he just has a, a really good, clean inking brush that works super, super well, I find. It's, it's probably the, one of the better ones out there. Normally, how it looks is a little bit kind of too many coffees line. That's how my that's how my yeah. illustrations work a lot of the time. So, Photoshop has this thing which is, I guess, semi new. It's not like super super new, but if you I can't remember the version, but um, you might not have it if you're on a super super old version. Um, but smoothing just means that your line goes from this to this and mm. it's just a lot cleaner it also helps to get that nice clean tapered edge as well mm. that we're looking for it's possible that we'll have to cut back on some of these as well um, and so cutting back means like when there's something like this you'll have to come back in and make that a little bit sharper right. that's probably something that's going to happen Ooh, that's a that was well done there i like that yeah it's, it's always that's easy that. when you're not actually drawing a thing when it's just a simple line but, all right um, it gets a little bit trickier when you're working into into the drawing itself mm. but um yeah um this is where we have we had the discussion yesterday where we were talking about like oh why don't you use illustrator because illustrator basically does this yeah like natively mm. um and I, I am sort of moving into illustrator territory which sort of historically has been something that i've 
not avoided, but been reluctant to go to. Uh -huh. um, it's like, oh, it's a whole other app. It's all the way over there. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's like, yeah, i got to <laughs> click another button. Come on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it's, I think it's just the, there's a feeling of drawing in Photoshop that you don't necessarily always have when you're using Adobe Illustrator. Well, also, you, as, as you mentioned on yesterday's stream, and as I know, you're classically trained as yeah, well. So you, exactly. have that, you have that foundation of presumably comfortability um, with, with being freehand. I, that's a word, right? It is now. It yeah. is in Sydney, so yeah, that's a that's a word in Australia. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you have you have it's it's uh, yeah your foundation is is around there, so it does make sense that that's where you will want to, you know, do that sort I of suppose. thing. I suppose, and and again, it's one of those things that we talked about yesterday, where it's you do your sketch in Photoshop because Photoshop is a drawing app. Yeah. Um, well, amongst other things, obviously, but yeah. Um, what I'm doing now, by the way, is because I've got pretty low resolution on this sketch. Um, and because I am using Photoshop, this is one of the, the pitfalls of Photoshop over Illustrator, is I do have to worry about future resolution. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna do with this, if I'm using Vector, I don't have to think about this at all. Um, so I'm just gonna boost this up from, currently it's an A3, I'm just gonna go to um, A, uh, sorry, it's an A4, I'm gonna go to A3. So that's uh, gonna be two, nine, seven mils by 420. And it's going to increase the resolution of my image. Yeah, there we go. Mm. So obviously I've lost some resolution, but on the sketch, who cares? It's it's a blurry pencil line anyways, right. and the sketch is probably not going to be in there anyways. Because so this is just a guide for you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And it just means that I've got a little bit more leeway when I'm using this. My line's going to be a little bit cleaner. We're not going to get that aliasing of the pixels as much. Mm. Um, I, I actually normally work a little bit bigger than that. I'd probably work at A2, yeah. um, just in case. When, when you're, you can always downscale, but you can't upscale, so mm. always good to be on the safe side. But for today, A3 is gonna be just fine. Um, and so yeah, then I'll just start getting to work. One of the things that I'll do as well is I'll take a note of the actual brush size that I'm working on, just so that I end up with some lines that are like this thick and other lines that are this thick, and it creates a kind of a lack of unity. Yeah. Especially if we're going for that kind of manga style. Um, we really want something that's going to be a little bit cleaner. So there's, there's going to be lines that are going to be a bit thinner, but as long as I'm around that sort of 15% um, 15 point mark, mm -hmm. I'll be all good. Um, and what you'll notice if you start using the um, smoothing tool is that there's a setting in smoothing that'll be right for you. 56 is probably a little bit much, maybe 30 is better. What it does is it kind of slows your pen stroke a little bit down and mm. It just means that you're not getting as immediate a response from the drawing as you might like. I've noticed that in, in with every app, with every platform I've used, yeah. if I turn the smoothing all the way up, it, it's kind of like, okay, we've got to figure this out as you're drawing. Exactly. So like, it kind of takes a little bit if longer. You're, for instance, if you want to kind of draw all the way to here, like you see how the cursor's there, Mm. Like when, if you can see, I don't know if you can, but the, the ring of the brush is actually reaching the hair before the yep. brush does. Yep. And so there's a tendency to go like, oh, I've ended up there and you don't go far enough. Right. Um, so there's definitely a little bit of kind of making up that you need to do for that, but it's about finding that setting that's kind of that sweet spot for you mm. um, and just playing around with it until you get there. And it, it might not be perfect, but again, I think it's all right to not be perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and we can always come back and fix it up later if we need to. I've also got my eraser on smooth. Um, and then, yeah, this is basically... Wait, you have your eraser on smooth? Yeah, absolutely. So the eraser has the same smooth setting. Um, and that's mostly so that, like, if I've got hmm. something like this, if it's not on smoothing, I won't be able to get that nice kind of clean cut. Right, so it's that well. consistency with exactly. the thing. Oh, that's yeah. super cool. I didn't think I didn't think about putting the eraser on smooth. Um, just shout out to the chat. Hey, everyone. Hey, Tim. It's good to see you in there. Moderator extraordinaire. Um, so yeah, so this will be me for a little while. Um, cool. And you'll notice that there's there's going to be some lines like this, for instance, that I'll have to come back and and cut into a little bit. Uh, again, I'm, it's, it's something that I've had to be a little bit conscious about um, recently, just kind of spending hours and hours and hours getting these lines down, which again, like you're seeing me, I just did that and then I undid it because it screwed up on the end. Um, it screwed up. Yeah, it screwed it for me. I did the <laughs> right thing. You were right. The program didn't do what I wanted it to do. Um, Every single circle I do never, never completes like this. That's perfect. Yeah. 
Sort of. But this again, this is where Illustrator would be like, oh, just, just do the a circle, circle yeah. and it's perfect for you. And even if it isn't, then you can come back and edit it. And then it's too perfect. A, a little bit. There is a... <laughs> That is actually a thing where it's just like you're, you're still making a drawing. Like it doesn't have to be like a schematic blueprint. Right. Um, but yeah, th I think what I usually kind of tend to think about when I'm doing this kind of stuff or when people ask me, you know, this would be a lot faster in Illustrator um, is absolutely true. Mm. But efficiency isn't necessarily always the end result, right? And right. I... I often compare it to um, walking. So if you're trying to find a, a way to get from A to B and you like, I don't know, you go to like Google Maps or whatever, mm. um, that program will always tell you the fastest, most efficient way of getting there. Mm. But if it's your walk to work, for instance, like you might have a nice, like maybe there's a park that you want to walk through. Right. And it actually adds like five or 10 minutes to your walk. Mm. But that's what you want to do. So I, I always kind of think about that in that same way. And people mm. go like, oh, you know, like Illustrator would be faster and more efficient. Like, yeah, but it would actually be less fun for me to do the thing because I don't yeah. feel like I'm drawing as much when I'm using Illustrator. Mm. Um, and I'm, again, like, I don't want to like rip into Illustrator too hard because it is a pretty awesome program. And I do use it a lot. And you'll see actually there's a few mm. things that I have done in Illustrator that will come in, um, in here. Um, but... It's the the point is here is like your process is your process, and uh, whatever you feel is right for you is what you should do, and there's always going to be people coming around saying, oh, there's this way of doing it, and, and sometimes you know like I've had people say that to me as well, and then I try it out and it's like, ah, oh, okay, that's actually changed my way of working. Yeah, thanks for showing me that. Um, but again, it's there's definitely this thing of like, you got to do what you got to do. It's true. Um, Festus was asking before, um, can you make this, could you make the sketch a smart object for when you want to increase the size? Uh, I could do. Yeah. Yeah, could I could that. do. Uh, I don't because I don't. I, yeah, I've, I've got no, like, smart reason for not doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's That's just the way you like to walk to work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the way I like to walk to work. Um but yeah, I could I could totally do that. Mm -hmm. But I don't. It's a good question. Owen's asking: um, Does the Lord awesome? Does the Lord uh, ever toggle between pressure for opacity and pressure for size? Uh, yes. So I, when I'm doing the sketch, mm -hmm. uh, originally I was doing the sketch. You'll see that I had that um, happening here, where there's size and opacity happening. Right. Um, when I'm doing inking like this, it's only on size. Um, because I, I don't want different levels of black. I want it always to just be the exact same. So in my shape dynamics, you'll see that the size jitter is on. And in transfer, which is down here, you'll see that it's off. Mm. So transfer controls the amount of opacity. So if I turn it on, you'll notice uh, if I go back to black, you'll notice that it goes from gray to black and thick to thin. Right. So that's cool when you're doing something a little bit more painterly, but at mm. this stage, I'm really just going for nice kind of digital inking marker kind of vibe. Mm. So I want it to be all kind of unanimously black throughout. Yeah. I just, just want the thickness to be slightly different. But not black, black, pressure. right? You changed that. Um, so that, that was, was a yesterday. Tip from so yesterday. That was pencil. Yeah, I like when that When you're too. doing inking, it it's going to be black. Yeah. All right? Um, it kind of doesn't matter because I could just change the color later on anyways. Sure. And I'll show you a quick way of doing that. But, um, yeah, when you're using pencil, kind of like a yellowish gray is always going to be a little bit more realistic looking. Mm. Uh, and when you're using inks, you want it to really be black. Um, so at this stage, I've got that um, visor thing that's on her. I'm just going to turn that off for a second because I'm actually going to do that on a different layer. So not all my inking is built equally and can exist on the same layer. Uh, so there is a thing as well where you can start thinking about um, having it be a little bit more painterly and having the outlines 
of each object be a darker color of that thing. So what I mean by that is like, for instance, what I will do, I'll jump ahead a little bit, is when that visor comes in and it's gonna be hot pink maybe, let's say, I will come in with a darker version of that and do the outlines of that object. And so that when it fills in, it mm. just feels a little bit less kind of closed in and locked into an actual color. Right. Um, but yeah, that's kind of jumping ahead a little bit. But there are people who will do like if the hair's brown, it's a dark brown for the outline of the hair. And then the face is kind of a dark skin tone. Mm. And then the headphones are a dark gray or whatever. Like, so you could go down a rabbit hole doing that, yeah, doing that kind yeah. of thing. And it just, it makes it feel a little bit more like an actual painting, like animation, because that's one of the things that they do in animation. Mm. You'll see, like, when they color it in, if you look at, like, a Ghibli cell, you'll notice that it's not black outlines. It's usually color outlines corresponding to whatever that line right. is outlining, if that makes sense. Hmm. Do you ever save your, your presets for brushes? Like, do you ever create presets um, with, all, with any of those Yeah, sometimes. Changes? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, just mostly because, we, we talked about this yesterday, like, I tend to use some pretty simple, like, straight-up Photoshop brushes mm. if I'm not downloading any. Uh, and they're quite easy to make. And so, yeah, again, it's just it's one of those things where I'm just like, I just want to get into the drawing and I don't want to have to do a whole setup. It's It's probably not the best thing to do, to, like makes my life a little bit more complicated because then I have more work to do. Right. But again, I just like I'm just keen to get into the actual drawing side of things and not have to like prep everything. It's a little bit like web, I guess, where it's like first you or like document making in InDesign where it's like first you make all your type layer styles and then you do all of this and then you can start mm. designing. It's like, ah, oh, just want to start designing. Just want to start designing. Yeah. So yeah, so this step will take me any anywhere, you know, from like 20 minutes to a bunch of hours. It mm. also depends on how thorough I've been and detailed I've been with the actual sketch that I've created. Right. So how how well past Jeremy did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and there is definitely that thing of like that's a future me problem. Right. And then future me curses past me. Um for not doing the work because the work has to be done at some stage. So if I'm having a struggle time with one of the hands, I might mm. skip it and be like, I can just do that when I'm inking. And it's like, no. I'll do it on the day. Yeah, <laughs> and just, no. It's, it's a lot harder to do inking um, than sketching when you're trying to draw something from scratch. Mm. So yeah, do, do yourself a favor and do it. But again, like, do what I say, not what I do. Um, I don't often do that there is a lot of times where i'll leave something really loose and then i'll just kind of curse myself later on mm. get like mad um like dragon ball vibes from this jacket yeah there's definitely a bit of like bulma happening yep. in here but again like this is what we're talking about right there's plenty of artists who take inspiration from that and and so they should because it is you know it's a pretty solid pop culture reference. It's something that a lot of people are probably going to get. Um, but it's also just really solid work. Mm. Um, and it's something that's kind of influenced a lot of people because a lot of people grew up watching those and so you want to put it in there. Mm. And we were talking yesterday about, you know, like plagiarism and influences and somebody who's equally influenced by Dragon Balls who's using those same things is inevitably going to have something that's going to be relatively similar to something that I'm doing that's also referencing the same thing. Mm. I think that's inevitable. And I think when people start losing their minds over like, oh, you copied, blah, blah, blah. It's like, mm. If only, if anything, the only person that I'm copying would be Akira Toriyama in this case, who's the, the artist and the creator of Dragon Balls. But mm. it's not even really copying because like this isn't Bulma and it's not a Dragon Ball Z character. And so it's right. all good. Right. But it's just influenced by, but again, like those, those cues of like the shoulder pads there and the kind of the visor, like Akira Toriyama didn't invent shoulder, like elbow pads or anything like that. So oh, that Game Boy's Nintendo, by the way. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> yeah, there is that. But yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Festus was saying just do it on the bus on the way to work. Have you ever tried to like do line work in like a situation like that? I couldn't imagine, I can't even type 
on the bus every now and then yeah. I'll get my laptop out and yeah. I'm like yeah I'll just knock out some work on the bus I have and, uh, I, I have, have instant tried. regret I have tried many a time mm. um, to do this because it's like it's the perfect time to to do that work right like you're just mm. sitting there doing nothing rather than be on Instagram or whatever the whole time um, do some work and then just like yeah the, the train will sway or the bus will sway or whatever or it'll stop abruptly and you're doing a line and it's perfect and then <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've kind of given up on that dream. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Thanks, thanks, that Johanna, sharing the the Dragon Ball Dragon Ball Z wiki, <laughs> which, is, which is good for anyone out there that doesn't know it. Um, there is also this thing of like, like I'll bring my iPad with me on the plane. Yeah. Um, so either like watch movies or or do anything, but. There's also this work thing, and like I used to, it's weird. Like I, you'd think it would go the other way, but I used to not care too much about people seeing me drawing. Right. And now, like, it really bugs me for some reason. Like. Yeah. And I, do, I don't. I would know have thought why. you would have gone the other way. Why do you think it bugs you now, and it didn't used to bug you? Well, it it should be a thing where it's like it used to bug you, and then you got over it. Right. Right. Exactly. And like I, I don't know, and I think it it might just be specifically in a plane or like. It's funny actually when I'm the you know ages ago when I still used to use my sketchbook it probably didn't bug me as much but because now it's an iPad there's something about it that's just like mm. I don't know don't ask me why but especially on a plane where it's not like you're not sitting next to that person for just like 20 minutes half an hour like you know you're sitting next to that person for hours and the plane goes dark and it's like your iPad screen is glowing and everybody can see it. And it's not just the person sitting next to you, it's people like in three or four aisles behind you. Right. They can look at your thing. It's like, I, yeah, I, I've kind of stopped doing that mostly because for some reason I get self-conscious about it it's now. It's like a social media thing as well. Like you feel like people could be like taking photos and, uh, and stuff. Yeah. You feel like you're like advertising have, behind you. I've never really you. thought about it like that. But am I oh, helping? I'm not helping, am I? So, so look at this, right? <laughs> this is what I was talking about before. Remember how I said that I was going to mess up and draw on the wrong layer for 20 minutes? Yep. That's exactly what I've done. Wow. So on the advisor <laughs> layer, I've gone ahead and drawn. So in this case, it's all good because no, there's no connecting lines. So I can use my selection tool and just do a rough selection around this. Right. If there were overlapping lines, I'd be really kicking myself. Now. In your defense, I'm sitting here asking really dumb questions the entire time, which like... Yeah. But you just, you like, you get it. into the thick of it and you don't notice <laughs> and everything. So you just like, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select that. I'm going to cut it and then I'm going to do command shift V and it's going to paste it in place. And then I'm going to turn on these two and merge them back together. So that yes. has just gone from that to now it's back on. The Why don't you cut layer. it and just put it right onto the outline layer? Does it not paste it in place? Or uh, something? If you paste it in place, it pastes it automatically. In exactly. The layer. Oh, okay. So right. it pastes, places it exactly where it was to begin with, but mm. it does it on a new layer, which is actually kind of handy. Mm. Um, and then you can just merge just two merge. layers together. Look at that. Um, so then I'm going to go ahead and idiot proof that layer as well so that doesn't happen again. And um, we were talking about for anyone that missed the first the first one the the typography on the back, like you brought that in from from the, Illustrator. So I yeah, created that Illustrator. in Illustrator. Yeah, um, I could have done it in Photoshop as well. It's literally just going into um, to a website, copy that kanji from actual text from mm. live text, and then pl placing it in there. Uh, most computers have a few. Um, Chinese or Japanese fonts preloaded into them. Mm. Um, so literally, that's what I've done. Um, but yeah, I, I just did it in Illustrator just because, you know, I don't want Illustrator to hate me completely. So I have to say hello to it sometimes. Thanks for the token, the token effort. Yeah. <laughs> and what, pla what platform do you, so today you're using a Surface, right? Yeah. In here, we're using this, this big giant Surface Studio Pro, which is like very, very nice to work on. What's your normal setup like at home? Um, so I have one of these. Uh, I've got an iPad. You also have a Surface, don't you? I do, yeah. yeah. Um, that Microsoft uh, gave me very generously as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have an iPad when I'm kind of on the go or when I'm sitting on the couch. And I also have a Cintiq. So I have all the toys. I like toys. All the toys. Um, yeah, every, every toy has its occasion and its use. Mm. 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend if you're just kind of starting out being that person and like getting all of those, uh, especially seeing as I thankfully didn't have to buy this computer. Microsoft very generously gave one to me. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely a thing, again, talking about how, you know, how you work is how you should stick to working. Mm. Um, and if you feel that there's something that's missing from your workflow and you need a certain um, thing to help you fix that, I guess, or like fulfill that, mm. then then don't hesitate. Like, I, I, I'm, I teach at Billy Blue as well, and a lot of students ask me, like, is it worth getting a a Wacom or an iPad or something like that or a drawing yeah. tablet of any kind of description and obviously they're worried about how expensive it is because they're not cheap for the most part mm-hmm. um, and you're like well just just get one for free that's what yeah, I do yeah exactly you know, yeah. That, that, yeah, that's, just, I'd recommend just, just be lucky why aren't you lucky <laughs> just get lucky here's what you do yeah. just get lucky just get free stuff it's great um, um, but there's the, I think if you're considering you know going into illustration as a career then like you're absolutely 100% going to need one of these. Mm. Um, and if you realistically, if you do like one or two jobs, depending on on sort of your level of confidence in charging and all that kind of stuff, mm. then it just pays for itself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, drawing with a mouse is just not on. There's no pressure sensitivity to begin with, so you can't get that opacity shift or the, mm-hmm. um, the thick and thin shift. And so, yeah, you, you're absolutely 100% going to need one of these. It's it's a little bit like saying, like, hey, I want to be a race car driver. Do I need a car? Yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Unless, again, unless you're going to work completely analog, and there are artists who will do that. Um, Some and other analogies for that. I really like that. It's kind of like um, wanting to be, a like, a road, like, bike rider and it's like yeah here's a pushy like, yeah he, exactly. here's your bmx yeah. it's like here's a skateboard it, you I'm can fine. ride it yeah but yeah eventually you gotta want to upgrade it'll take you places yeah um it's it's quite it is quite interesting because often you you if you're lucky enough to get the tools like some like i am as well i have lots of toys and tools to play with how amazingly um bad you are <laughs> immediately maybe not everybody but but for me i thought cool i've got i've got my ipad especially when photoshop for the ipad came out and i was sketching around with that and i was like oh i actually you need talent as well and a commitment to the craft yeah and practice obviously yeah. Um, it's a little bit like getting a really good camera and just thinking, oh, yeah, great, I'm going to take great no, photos now. <laughs> it's like, yeah. turns out, yeah, it's probably going to take a long time to, to, develop, to develop this skill. But in fairness, also, like, getting that really good camera with that good lens is definitely going to help you take better photos. That does help. Right? It like, when help. you do yeah. understand how composition works mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff and you, you get the basics of photography, then it's really going to help you out. Mm. And I think, I think that's one of the important things as well. We spoke about this in sort of earlier episodes is really this is just a high-tech pencil yeah really yeah um so you know you still need to learn the basics of drawing and we kind of went through that yesterday a little bit um but yeah i think that that conception which is thankfully kind of going away uh, progressively but there is still that thought that it's like oh i'm going to do this and then it's just going to make my artwork awesome Mm. you you still need to be involved on a pretty solid level in order for that to happen. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely right. I think we might um, bring the schedule up for those that might be just joining us now. So um, we're here with Jeremy Law. We started about half an hour ago, believe it or not. My God. Um, And so here's our schedule. Still got yesterday's up here. But um, so we're creating a Mango Character Part 2, which is the third one down there. So that's with Jeremy. That's what we're doing right now. And then at three, so if you want to stick around, we're actually going to show off some iPad skills as well uh, in Fresco with Bill Hope. Um, So again, we've given him the brief of the Lunar New Year, um, and I think we've we've got some rat rat boys in there. So it's it's pretty cool because we've got Rat Girl. We can hang out together right here. Yeah, and then Rat Boy with Bill Hope, um, which will be in less than an hour actually. So wow, it goes pretty goes pretty fast. Um, But don't forget to ask your questions as well. So ask us questions while we're going. Um, so I've got a question, which I know the answer to, but I think it's quite cool to talk about is where you get the, insp- where you get the, the love for like to kind of, typically it's Japanese inspired stuff. And we've spoken about this, that actually like Dragon Ball and, um, all sorts of like Japanimation and all that sort of stuff was huge in France yeah. when you were growing up. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, so I'm half French. I I grew up in in France for most of my life, mm. um, and and yeah, they had a sort of a very big sort of cultural exchange where we were lucky enough to get uh, manga on TV that the rest of the world had a, maybe a bit of a harder time getting their hands on. Uh, and I just kind of turned on the channel and just saw all these things. Mm. Um, and so that kind of had really had a big impact on me. And talk, we would talk about Dragon Ball Z a lot. And it's, you know, for the, for the manga purists out there, it's probably like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Like, talk about the most, like, mainstream manga there is, um, which it is, because mm. it's incredibly popular. Um, but that is the thing that actually got me into drawing in the first place, mm. where I really sort of... I, I literally, in some cases, traced a lot of his drawings, um, and there is there is value in tracing for sure because we spoke about this yesterday a little bit. This uh, this idea that it's muscle memory of mm. a repeated movement, yeah, um, and so tracing kind of lets you practice that move before you do it for real, uh, and there is definitely merit. In, in doing that. Obviously, don't trace an image and then call it your own or say, like, look at what I drew. Right. Because it's not your original content, nor is it something that you've actually created yourself. Um, but there is definitely something to be said about it if you're learning about taking something like that and just tracing it and redrawing the characters as you see them. Mm. Um, that's definitely helpful. So I did that for a little while, and which meant that, you know, probably like a lot of people who watch those things or are into drawing, I drew a lot of like big buff guys with massive eyebrows and spiky hair. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of that gave me inklings into, you know, human anatomy because those drawings are very, you know, there's a lot of human body stuff in that manga. Mm. Um, and they're actually, for the most part, really super well done and quite accurate anatomically um so yeah so that kind of gave me a bit of an inkling into like what it takes to, in order to do that uh, and then i got sort of properly trained in a french art school um and then that kind of taught me how to how to draw a little bit more but then i think one of the things that's really important to think about is this idea that a good drawing is one that's accurate as in, like, oh, you're drawing, um, you're drawing a rat, or you're drawing a, a, an apple, or a still life, or a skull, or whatever, um, and only the ones that are super lifelike are going to be judged as kind of deemed as good drawings, right? Uh, and I think that's a problem because you you can literally just do like a little skull that's kind of a little bit fun like this, and that's you know that's got merit to it as well. Like that's an illustration. Um, I like this little skull. Yeah. It's cool. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. But the, the thing is, is like actually so that was pretty the, cool. um, the realism is super easy. Yeah. Because it doesn't take any creativity. Like, I, I'm, I don't want to say that like too nastily because there are a lot of artists and some of them that I really like mm. who work with this notion of like that their style is quite sort of photorealistic. Yeah. So I don't want to take anything away from that. But where what you're doing is like you're drawing, drawing a still life, for instance, where you're literally just copying what's in front of you. Mm. There's less sort of creative input into that than into something like this, where you actually mm. have to think about what she's going to look like, what she, you know, who she is, how she behaves, all this kind of stuff. Uh, decisions that you need to make that nobody's going to tell you, whereas a still life, all the information isn't in front of you. You just need to copy it. Mm. Um, and so the analogy that I use is a little bit like um, it's a little bit like if you drew if you took a copy of like Romeo and Juliet and then you by hand recopied the whole thing mm. you couldn't then turn around and say that you wrote a book right Right. like literally you wrote a book because you wrote right. a text that comprises the right. book but you didn't do anything creative you yeah. just copied word for word yeah. and yeah that's a challenge and yeah it requires a lot of skill and it's going to take you a long time, long time and it's still yeah. like it's still impressive in itself mm. but there's nothing creative about it right. in a way yeah. um, and what I think the distinction that needs to be made here before sort of you know torches and pitchforks mm. get 
lit up is there's plenty of artwork out there that are hyper real, but mm. in my brain, I think what happens is the the artwork then is not about the finished product, it's about the process. The process mm. is the artwork. Yeah. So there's um, there's a guy who does these like crazy photorealistic images of cats mm. and their pencil. And like, I've got a cat, I love cats. Mm. But if you look at it, you would totally think it's a photograph. Right, yeah. But you see that stuff really, do the rounds on the internet like quite a lot. Yeah, and it's, and it's not a very interesting photograph. Like if it was a photograph, it wouldn't win any awards whatsoever because it's just like, oh, right. it's a black and white photo that somebody took of their cat on their iPhone or whatever. Yeah. Okay. It's that. But because then you find out that it's drawing, people are like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Right. So then it's, it's not about the finished piece that's amazing. It's the process. Once the you skill. know the process yeah. that went into it and you can imagine the amount of skill and time that went into it, then, mm. then you're like, your mind is blown and you realize this is incredible. Yeah. When actually the image itself is not very interesting. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do a little thing here uh, and possibly um, haters are going to hate and call it cheating, but I'm going to use the symmetry tool <gasps> to do this lantern. Yeah. Wow. So we've got this lantern and, you know, again, like I could try and like I've done this. The, the sketch was originally done with the symmetry tool, but I kind of wanted to show it off here. So it's going to be a little bit more even. I'm doing it on a separate layer as well so that I can move it around because mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it's going to be there. I might need to rescale it or whatever um, when the composition ends. But it's just going to mean that I'm not going to end up with a lantern that's going to be like this on one side and then that on the other side. And it's just like, obviously, I'm exaggerating. Mm -hmm. um, Hopefully I'm not that bad, but yeah, it's just nice when you're doing these things to use a symmetry tool. So symmetry tool is up here. You click on this little butterfly and there's a bunch of different symmetry tools that you can do here. We're looking for a vertical one and there it is. So if I um, zoom out here, I can go back into this. Uh, sorry, I'm going to turn it off and then put it back on. And this is like any other object. I can move it around, I can rescale it, I can rotate it as well if mm. I want to, but I don't want to. Uh, and I'm just going to put it roughly in the middle, and there we go. So what's going to happen here is when I draw on one side, you'll see that it will repeat the exact same thing on the other side. Mm -hmm. So anything that happens over there, you'll just get this perfect symmetry on both sides. And on one end, it means that I only need to draw half the drawing, so it saves some time. But it also means that my lantern is going to be nice and symmetrical all the way straight away through. Uh, it might not be top and bottom, but whatever. Hmm. Festus was saying that you have amazing line control for drawing. It's very smooth. Uh, thanks. That's. I think again, that's just like muscle memory because mm. I spend eighty percent of my time doing a line, undoing it. Like whenever you see a time lapse. That I that I've done. It's there's a lot of like on off on off on off redo right. undo because it's just not right. Which again is like it's those moments where I'm like maybe the people who tell me to use Illustrator have a point because <laughs> then I could just do the line and then fix it. But again, that to me is less akin to drawing. Yeah, like it's it's make a mistake and then fix the mistake. I like which is fine and I do use undo a lot and I you know we talk about non destructive and all that, but. There's definitely something about, yeah, that feeling of like nailing that line first go or not first or 17th go or whatever. Mm. Um, that just, it just feels a lot more akin to, to drawing. And for somebody who's, again, like classically trained who doesn't spend a lot of time in their sketchbook anymore and maybe misses it, doing this kind of thing is just going to be a lot it's going to kind of scratch that itch a little bit better. Mm. I remember when the symmetry tool came in and it was like hidden in a menu as well. Just to, yeah. just to see how everyone takes it, I yeah. think. Um, so at this stage, I might actually turn the symmetry off. So the nice thing is if you turn it back on, um, you can turn it on to the last symmetry that you yeah. used. So I'm just going to turn it off because what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to draw a few kind of like horizontal like fold lines and I don't want them be, to be similar. Um, I'm also going to turn that layer off so I can see what I'm doing a little bit better. And so this is going to be a little bit freehand but I kind of want it to be that because I'm just 
giving it that little bit of kind of texture. Yeah, that was going to be a question I, I asked was because you use the symmetry tool, do you want to also get in there and put in like a little bit of, I don't know the best word to use, but like almost human error yeah, in there just absolutely. to kind of break break the symmetry because yep. otherwise we see it and we think, why is why is that perfect? But everything else has this handmade exactly. kind and of it's, thing. It's a little bit like... You know, like with like handwritten typefaces and you look for it and there's like two yeah. letters that repeat and you look for those like, oh, those two are exactly the same. It's a typeface. It's like any, design, any designer will look at that and be like, oh, yeah. it's a script. Yeah. Uh. yeah. Um, yeah. So there, there is definitely that element to it. Mm. But if I wanted to put like a kanji on here or whatever, like if I'm using the symmetry tool, obviously that's going to break it. So right. good to be able to right. switch that on and off. Mm. Um, and then for these like kind of little like Chinese charm here that I've got. Again, like that's just going to be amazing to do stuff like this. And this is where, again, it's I think it's important to remember, like the tools there, use it. Like why mm. why this kind of like guilt of not using these tools? Um, and so I'm just going to do this guy. Whoops. And then literally. And it's just going to be the exact kind of perfect it weave that I cool. need to get. That's it's awesome. also yeah, it's also a little bit like that kaleidoscope mesmerizing thing to, to look at. It was quite fun to, to watch. Yeah, it's like nice. Uh, and then this tassel here again, I'm just going to turn that off because I want it to be a little bit less even and hmm. a little bit natural, right? So yeah. And I think. That's about everything. So I can then have a look at, oh, no, sorry, I'm missing the top. There we go. So now I can start adding color. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is where like the real fun begins. Once all this kind of like homework is done, then you can start to, to pick this up a little bit. So there's two ways about doing this. Obviously, like the bulk of my work, as you can see from my website, is usually um, color. Cool. All right. Um, so I'm a big fan of using color. I feel like we have this discussion actually with a few um, illustrator friends of mine who use predominantly black and white on to which one's harder, color or black and white. And it's actually a little bit counterintuitive because you'd think that color would be harder to use. Mm. I would seriously disagree with that. Right. Because color, you can have this separation of line work, values, and shading. Mm. Like, there's literally, in any kind of given piece of something like this, for instance, like, there's three different levels to this. There's the color, there's the lighting, and there's the line work. And all three are completely separated by color. Right. And when yeah. you're using black and white, that one color black needs to communicate all three of those. Right. And that... That for me is just a complete, like mind-bending thing that makes it really difficult to use. Mm. On the on the other side of things is that argument that's like, yeah, but then you don't need to mess around with colors and sort of tossing up which colors to use because it's just the one color. Mm. But only having that one word in your language makes it incredibly hard to communicate with. Yeah, true. Um, so, so you have like more tools in your toolbox to yeah to like communicate. So these are like I use this as a kind of resource for myself. Um, and what it is basically is just, uh, let's hide that. It's just a bunch of color wheels that I've created all around kind of this six color theme. Mm. And you can see there's a lot of them that are repeating. Um, some of them are quite similar. Again, because I'm a big fan of the 80s, I like neon, I like cyberpunk. There's bound to be this kind of color themes that repeat. Um, but for this one, because we're going Chinese, um, we're gonna play around with this color scheme. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna bring this in to my artwork. I'm going to flatten this down and drag it into my piece here. Uh, probably a good idea at this stage to save what you've done. Right. Um, also, Photoshop has a, like a, a recovery thing, but just a good idea to, to get into that mode. So yeah, more and more what I've, what I've started doing, because I'm kind of getting my cues from Manga, is I've started doing work like this, where it literally is just black with that kind of cream color that's that sort of you know manga mm. page kind of vibe. Uh, and this is super fun for me to do, but you'll notice that there's no shading in here. Right. Um, what I can do sometimes, this one has got a little bit of color, but, um, and this actually was done all in fresco. 
And so it's all vector. So oh, talking cool. about like how to get into vector. Um, what you can do in order to do this kind of stuff is to use halftones, which manga artists do use. So it's still black. You're not adding in another color, but you're adding in tone mm. with that. And it just, it makes it like from a stylistic point of view, it really communicates this idea of manga and like cartoon and graphically looks really cool. But also from a functional point of view, it's still just that one color. So cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Where did you originally get these color palettes from? So like, these are all from some of the pieces that I've done in the past. Right. Yeah. So they're ba basically when I'll do a piece and I like the colors of it, I'll add this to one of the wheels. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'll try and do one of these beforehand and then work to that, which is what I'm doing with this one. Um, but will I seriously doubt that this piece will end up using those colors exactly. Right. Because I'll, I'll put them all together and then I won't like it and I want to change the blue or something else. It's so somewhere, somewhere to start. It's a guide. Yeah, it's, it's a, like guide. a guide. So again, like th some of the color swatches that I had in here were, were not very conducive to getting that kind of Chinese feel. And again, like mm. red and yellow, uh, like, oh, okay, very stereotypical colors. Yeah, but they're the colors that exist that most people are going to connect with and think sort of Chinese themes. Mm. Um, so yeah. So just quickly, how much time have we got left? Um, uh, 10 minutes? No, about like 40 minutes, oh, okay. 35 yeah, minutes. Cool. Sweet. Th a little bit less than 35 minutes. All right. So what I'll do yeah. is there's two ways of doing this. Um, if I'm working in black and white, I'll just put it in there, but we're working mm -hmm. in color. Some people like to go grayscale and add colors to that, um, which is a, an easier way to go because you can get those tones and values down. I'm going to save shading for the last one. So I'm not going to worry about that. Mm. Um, so I'm literally going to start by creating a group and then adding a bunch of layers in there. And I'm going to call this one Coles for colors. That's my This is your short this is your shorthand. Yeah. So and again, there's there's like 17 different ways that I could go about doing this. Again, this is one of the the beauties of Photoshop is that like hey, there's 20 other ways you could do what you just did. Yeah. And all of them are perfectly viable. It just depends on how you want to work. Um, so what I could do here is I could create something that I'm going to call main and literally just go in with whatever color. It doesn't have to be a specific color at this stage and we can always edit those later on. Um, and then block out the, uh, and I should name this one lantern. And that one's visor. There we go. I'm going to hide both of those or maybe not actually that one and I'm going to go into my main color and that obviously needs to be underneath my outlines and so I can do one of two things here I can actually block out the entire thing and I'm using the lasso tool to do this quickly and because I'm using these thick black outlines I've got a bunch of leeway so just quickly um, if I undo that you can see that my line in here I can make it real scrappy and horrible because I've got that kind of margin of error because of the thickness of the lines. Yeah. Um, and that's just going to allow me to fill in those layers without necessarily being um, too clean about it. Is that what you would normally do? Yeah, always. You would always do it without, yeah. you wouldn't use the pen tool to try to get it exact? No, because again, the pen tool doesn't feel like drawing. Right. So you could argue that this doesn't feel like drawing. Like if you're really concerned about drawing, then you should just be doing this, right? Like literally painting it in. Right. But painting it in, you're going to miss these little like scarics of color in here. It's, there's going to be a bit too mm. much human error and it's going to take a lot of work to come back and fix it. Yeah. So I know I said I'm not too concerned about efficiency, but it's also kind of good to finish your pieces sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the last two tools just going to allow me to do that a little bit more and it's still kind of freehand so it still kind of feels like drawing uh, and then once that's complete i will use uh, command backspace and that will fill with my background color so if i turn that layer off you'll see that or um, alt backspace will fill with my foreground color so it's just a quick way of filling that in without having to go into edit fill and press enter and all that um, so yes yeah, so i'll spend a little bit of time doing this so Either one of two things, either I will, and I'll do this really roughly for the sake of um, moving things along a little bit, either I'll actually fill the entire shape I've got here with this outline, 
And again, I'm doing this really poorly at the moment because it's a bit faster. And then what I can do is I can use that. So if I press control and click on that, it'll create a selection. Mm -hmm. And then I can make a layer mask out of that. And then I can drag that layer mask onto my group, which means that if I come in and fill that, so you can see my selection is huge now, it goes way above her head. If I fill that, it's done that, but because I've got that layer mask in there, mm. it's always gonna apply that to this, all right? So what that means is that later on, when I'm on another layer, because it's on my group, if I wanna fill her little like rabbit ears or rat ears, I should say, with another color, I can be as sloppy as I want over here, as long as I outline that in there, it's always gonna look super clean. So yeah, if I turn cool. that off again, it's messy as all anything, but with that on there, it just means that I've got that, right? That's super cool. So it's, it, it's gonna save me some time. The only problem with this is that if I wanna then send this to a screen printer to put on a t-shirt, I'm gonna have to undo all of that and clean it up and it's gonna get really messy. So I right. generally don't do that, mm. but you will see people doing time lapses who will do that and then add to it. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, if they know way, it's only going to live online, perhaps, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So another way of doing exactly the same thing is to do something like this. So again, let's say that I'm going to go ahead and either way, you're going to have to, at some stage, you're going to have to do the work of blocking out the entire shape, right? Whether you're doing it with a selection tool or with a brush or drawing it or whatever, you're going to have to do your homework and do this whole process at some stage. Right. Um, so again, I'll just do the top half of that. While, okay. you, while you're doing that, there was a question. Do you ever use Adobe Color to help you? Uh, you yeah, sometimes. Time? Sometimes. Yeah. Um, but again, just because what I would normally do, to be honest, is I would use the hue saturation, and mm -hmm. we'll touch upon that in a sec, and then just slide these around until oh, right. I see what I like, mm -hmm. and then add those colors in a little bit later on. Um, but I, I would use Adobe Color um, sometimes, mm -hmm. but I usually just like to kind of try my own color palettes and go for a specific thing, um, mm. and then edit that on the fly as I go. And I've noticed that also from other artists that they, they do have, they create their own color libraries of, of what they yeah. what they want to use. Um, it is very interesting with color. It's so subjective. Everyone has their own their own thing. Obviously you have your own your own style with it. Um, and I've had um, some, some artists on before who use um, Adobe Capture to capture colors while they're traveling and mm -hmm. then they bring those colors back. Um, as yep. an authentic way to tie it into a like location, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is another interesting way that you can kind of play around with color. But I like how everyone has their own little their own system. Yeah, and again, it comes back to what we were talking about before, where it's just like whatever is right for you, whatever you feel is good. Mm. And there's there's maybe a faster way, maybe there's a smarter way, but whatever, it's your way, so you do it. Um, so again, this is another way, and this is probably something that I use a little bit more frequently, um, but. I can create a new layer, and by holding down Option, I can make this, I don't actually know what the term is for this particular, particular type of layer. If anybody knows in the chat, mm. um, please let me know, but um, I just call it a, a slave layer, because it's kind of slave to this layer, right. um, but it's probably not called that. Um, so what that does basically is, if I now come in with like, let's say I'm gonna come in with like a, a bright blue for her hair. Um, if I'm painting over here, you'll see that nothing happens, all right? As soon as I get on top of where my red goes, it starts to fill that in. So when the fun happens. Yeah, so this is basically saying, I am slave to where pixels exist on the layer beneath it. Right. And I will only affect, uh, I'll only do stuff when you're putting me there. So obviously that means that if I'm painting in this section of the hair and I go over here into the face, then I've screwed up and I can't do that. Mm -hmm. But it's just a nice way to kind of add all those colors without having to worry too much about it. Mm -hmm. But again, later on when you're outputting this, this might come back to bite you a little bit. And to be fair, it's not that much extra work for me at this stage to just create a, a new layer like normal and then just use my 
brush or my lasso tool to fill that in exactly the same way. And then I've basically got the same result. So again, three different ways of doing exactly the same thing. Mm. It just depends on what you're trying to do later on. Super cool. Festus was saying that Adobe Capture is in also within Photoshop. What? I didn't know that. I didn't know Sounds that. Sounds like something I should know. That's super cool. I have to check. I have to look into that. It's very cool. And yeah, of course, like um, using Adobe libraries to, if you're going within multiple apps is super useful. Um, yeah. Obviously, you can, you can stick them in. I use it a lot for branding projects that I use where you've got to get yeah. the, right, the right hex colors for everything, the right... Um, icons and H1s and H2s and logos and stuff like that. It's, a, it's such a time saver for that. I like this red wrap. I know it's not going to stay, probably not going to stay red, but. Uh, well, I think we'll make the sleeves a different color. Mm -hmm. So again, this is where like I've got that red that's gone onto the sleeves here. So what I could do is, let me just turn on my screen sketch again, I'm going to pop this up here, and that's on a load opacity, so that's all good. So I'm going to actually grab this section of the sleeve, it's going to be kind of like a varsity kind of sports jacket kind of thing, and grab that, and I'm going to do my little cut and copy, like so. Mm -hmm. um, and line. so one of two things that I can do here is either I can go to Control U, Command U, and bring up this hue sat, and then change the color of that until I get something that I like. But if I'm working to a specific color wheel, matching it that way is going to be really tricky. Right. So what I want to do here is, let's say I want the sleeve to be yellow. It's probably going to not be yellow, but who cares? So if you did it, if you did that other way with the hue sat, you'd be doing it by eye. Yeah. So you're, you're eyeballing. And if you're yeah. working with other designers to Pantone colors, then that's no. Yeah. It's like you can't do that. three or four slightly off colors that exactly. are very, very similar, but yeah, yeah technically different, yeah. Yeah, okay. and in some cases you'll probably get like in legal trouble for that because it's not the brand's color and yeah. Right. So if you're, if you're trying to match it to an exact color, then that's not the way to go. But what you can do is you can eye drop that color that you've got mm. down in your swatches. Um, and rather than repaint the whole bloody thing, which is a bit annoying, I'm going to pixel lock this to just the sleeve, all right? So I'm gonna go up to here and go click on that one, which is this little check. If you hover over it, it should say, yeah, lock transparency pixels. Mm -hmm. And then I can use my little fill tool, option delete, and that'll fill it exactly with that color. With your, four, with your foreground color. Yeah, with the color yep. that I picked. If you do that without having that option on, it's just gonna fill the whole layer. Right. Right. Yeah. So it just says like the pixels that already exist, fill them with that color, and then we're good to go. Mm. And obviously then you want to turn it off because you won't be able to erase or add anything to it and so on and so forth. So then I'm just going to keep adding and you can see that because I'm adding faster than I can be bothered to, I'm not naming these, which is bad, but... You can do it at the end. Yeah, I'll do it. It's fine. Homework, bit of homework. I'll do it when it becomes a problem. <laughs> We're chatting about the Adobe Capture within Photoshop. If Paul Tranny did it, he might have he might have access to a future version. Maybe that's my excuse for not knowing. Um, <laughs> he gets all the good stuff. But yeah, that'll be interesting. I'm going to check that out. See see if we can do that because I do use Adobe Capture. It's pretty sweet. What does it do exactly? Well, it does a couple of things. It does like five different things. But one of the main ones I use it for is it just uses your phone. And if you, if you take a photo, you can take a still photo within Adobe Capture and then it will select five of the colors right. within that photo. Yep. And you can move them around live or even in the still. And so you can use it to select like a color palette. Right, so it's like eye dropping the colors from that photo. Yeah, and you get, you get five um, and then you can save them. And if it's, you know, you log in with your um, Creative Cloud account, it'll just sync across as a, light, as a, like a color palette. So you can do it straight away, and then you could have it on your iPad like yep. that second, which is pretty pretty cool, pretty useful. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Problem here. Again, there's always like whatever way you're going to do, there's going to be some pros and cons to um, that are going to be more or less tricky to to resolve. Mm. In this case, because I went too far on that with my copy, 
I want to erase it, but when I erased it, the red behind it wasn't there because I'd cut it. Right. And so that got a little bit tricky. Like if I go too far here, you'll see that's what's going to happen. Okay. So it can be a little bit funky, which is why I would normally actually just do mm. a base where the whole thing is filled with a color mm. and then work from that in there and then there's no more kind of issues with that white color. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, what am I looking at now? Just getting in a few different kind of colors and things. Again, this is where like maybe, maybe not, I will kind of keep these color, color schemes going. Right, this might be a fork in the road as you're starting yeah, to, exactly. to build it out. Depending on how the whole thing looks, right? So mm. we've got this also this rule I mentioned yesterday, the 60-30-10 rule. So yeah, explain that again. So that, that's to do with colors, right? Yeah, so yeah. colors, it's, it's actually kind of like an interior designer thing. Right. Where if you're designing a room, you, the origin, this kind of idea of 60-30-10 is you've got three colors, three yeah. main colors. Um, your main color is going to be used in 60% of the room. Mm. Then you've got a secondary color, which is going to be used a little bit less in 30% of the room. And then you've got a highlight color that just makes everything pop. Right. And that's going to be 10%. Mm. Right? So it's a little bit like if you had like a you know, black, white, and red, and you were decorating a room, like all your shelves and everything... Like all the walls might be white and that's your 60. Mm. And then you've got some like furniture in there that's black, that's your 30. Right. And then you've got a, like a carpet and a painting on the wall that are going to be bright red right. and that's your 10. Mm. And it's just a little hard. Obviously, you probably don't want the walls to be bright red because no. that's a little bit full on. Um, but yeah, 60, 30, 10 is going to be this thing. So in this case, obviously, I've got six colors in here. Mm. But um, probably my red is going to be my 60. My yellow is going to be my 30, and then <laughs> any one of these is going to be my 10. Right. These two don't count. They count as one. Which, which two? The so the red and the, red the, and the, the dark red. Dark right? red. So they both count as one because that's just a shading tone of that. Okay. That I've planned for. It's not red, by the way. When you're using this color theory, you'll see that this has got a, it's like a, it's a tiny little bit of blue that you might not be able to see super well on your screens. Um, don't ever take a color and just add black. Right. That's just that it's not really a kind of a good color theory thing to do. Um, we'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit more when we talk, speak about shading, but it's always a little bit better to have another color mixed into there. Yeah. It's something that kind of the impressionists um, started doing, and it definitely is um, something that you guys want to think about um, doing as well. Cool. Um, I might make her skin dark, dark blue, and then completely regret it later on, but who cares? <laughs> Let's see what happens. Again, this is where, like, I'm doing these colors now, and then we'll see how much I actually change them later on. Mm. Um, because immediately I can see here that that's not going to work super well with my contrast. That's going to create some problems, like... If I zoom out of this, it starts to get lost a little bit. Right. Um, so that's potentially going to be a problem. Uh, I'll address that a little bit later. The idea behind this kind of dark, slightly desaturated blue is it's meant to be kind of like rat, rat fur tone. I could make a brown, but brown's just a nasty, horrible color and I don't ever use it's it. It's not much fun, is it? No. No. Um, I like, I like to have things be a little bit more kind of vibrant and saturated than that. So I'm just going to go with this kind of gray. But then again, it's not gray. It's this kind of blue. It works well with the hair because mm. it's a nice kind of color, color contrast. Uh, but down here, it's causing me some issues. So maybe right. the issue is not so much the skin. Maybe the issue is that the skirt needs to change colors. It's a little bit Kirk um, Wagner. Hey? It's a little bit Kirk Wagner. Yeah. Yeah. Nightcrawler. Um, so, hot tip as well when you guys are doing um, something like this and you're being lazy like me and not naming your layers, which hopefully won't happen too often, but it's probably definitely going to happen because you're all humans, to identify which layer the skirt is on rather than turn it on and off a million times, um, which I have done. My skirt and my jacket are on the same layer, so I'm going to have to fix that. Mm -hmm. 
and take that. Whoops. Um, you can use your move tool and set it to auto select up here in the right. screen. And what that does is it basically allows you to literally touch the layer that you're after and it automatically selects it. All right. So if you can't see in here what it is because it's too small or the colors are too similar. Or you haven't named your layers. Get, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You haven't named your layers. You can just use that to, to do that. I use that quite a bit because mm, I get layers cool. like that quite a bit. Um, and then this is where I'll start sort of, you know, heading away from this color wheel that I chose mm -hmm. and just go, all right, the, I like all the other colors in here, but I just don't like that skirt um, and it's just not working for me. So maybe it also needs to be this same red. It's a bit better, mm -hmm. it's maybe lacking a little bit of variety, but again, like because it's on a separate layer, I can fix that later on. Um, so this again is where we can kind of touch upon this idea of like how many layers is too many layers. like. I want the shoulder pads to be, the, the elbow pads, sorry, to be a different color, right? Mm. So I've got my highlights here are on, uh, they're also on the same layer. So what's happening here, right? I've messed up again. Um, really going for it today. <laughs> um, we got time. That red on here. There we go. And now my took you about f four seconds yeah, to, to fix that. Yeah, but it still that. kind of like takes you out of the groove a little <laughs> bit. So these guys are now kind of like a little bit of that highlight factor that I can use. Um, so ideally I'd probably want this to be the same color, really, as those, because that's also going to be a highlight. But mm. you might not want to, uh, and you might want to edit that a little bit later on. And if you did, you'd be tempted maybe to put that on a separate layer. But again, like, this is where maybe layers can get out of hand and you can just have too many because then you've got band-aid number one is on a layer, band-aid number two is on a layer, this right. little thing. And then what do you name it as well? It's like outline around shoulder pad on left sleeve. Right. So what's, the, what's the shorthand for that? <laughs> so there is a there is a, a, you know, a case to be made for just like maybe you can commit to certain things when you're doing this and not always have to worry too much about what if I want to undo? Because mm. it's still possible for me to undo this. I'll just have to do a little bit more selection work. Right. But it's totally possible and it's not going to take decades for me to do that. But yeah, it's again, it's striking that fine balance in between like micromanaging your file mm. and actually getting something that works well for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, color of the shoes will probably be yellow. And I'm Some nice high tops. Do you wear high tops? Yeah. You do wear high tops, don't you? A bit of a sneaker head. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so those are going to be mostly yellow. And I might come in with that blue of the hair as well to kind of pick that up. And it all kind of ties in as well. So you want... You know, you want to limit the amount of colors that you're using when you're doing a piece like this, mm. um, or any piece really, um, to get that kind of cohesion throughout. If everything mm. is just the, like all the colors of the rainbow, it's going to be A, very difficult to make sense of the image itself, right? and B, just like it's going to be really messy. And it's also going to invite you to just make change upon change upon change and just work for ages on all of this. Mm. Um, so if I'm doing that, there is maybe a call for me to group all the same colors on the same layers, in which case then instead of calling this layer hair, I'd call it blues. Right. Because I might make that decision that all of my layers, all of my blues are always going to be the same color, even if they're not that actual blue, they're always going to be unanimously changing throughout. So again, right. I could do that. I could not do that. There's no right or wrong. It just depends on what I'm kind of going for. Is that something that you might do at the end when you know you've ended up, okay, I've got, I've got four colors. Um, sometimes clients come back and say, great, can we, can we try some different combinations? And that way you can show, cool, here's 10, just yeah. 10 or three or, or whatever, like variations of, of the colors. Yeah, you, would, you could totally do that. And I think when you're working with clients, 
they will usually kind of give you a little bit more direction that you right. might not give yourself. Um, so usually when I'm working for a client, yeah, they'll give me like, we want to use these colors. Mm. Sometimes they're not colors that I'm particularly in love with. Right. They might like the brand colors or yeah, campaign yeah. colors yeah, or something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or there's just like, we want to do a winter piece, so we're going to use, you know, just like brown. whites and creams and yeah, yes. brown. We have three shades of brown. No. <laughs> and we've come to you because we think that you're the right, yeah, you're the right exactly. illustrator for the job. But you know what, again, like we were talking about this yesterday of like mm. that responsibility that a client should have, but yeah. also a designer should have. Like if you're, if you're looking at my website and going like, hey, yeah, we need an illustration done with like shades of brown. And you look at this and go like, this guy is the person to do it something's wrong <laughs> that's true yeah um so at this point i might also just throw in a background color just so i can see how everything's gonna pop and because i like to work with lighting and lighting's only ever gonna work in so far as the like if a light is on at like high noon it's gonna yeah. be way less bright than if it was on at midnight Right. All right. So putting on, like, for instance, and we'll, we'll do this a lot more tomorrow, but mm. um, putting on a highlight from this, like, Game Boy screen here on something like this where we've already got that white background there, that's not really popping too much, right? That's not really kind of giving us that nice kind of glow feeling that we're after. Right. Um, but if I go into my layers here and chuck in this skin tone, then all of a sudden that really starts to accent a lot more. Mm. Yeah. Um, so again, that's that's for tomorrow. Spoiler alert. But I'd like to throw in this color at this stage just so mm. that we can kind of see where we're going. Obviously, I'm going to have some issues with the color of a skin because it's exactly the same color as a skin. So maybe. I'll make that even darker. I might just play with trying to get, I don't know, like maybe like a turquoisey mm. kind of color that works well, maybe. Maybe it's too poppy with the red. Again, like all these things I can fix a little bit later on right. and see how we go. We are getting close to the end, actually. So if anyone has any last, last questions for today, throw them in the chat. We'll try to get to them. Um, but we will be back tomorrow in Sydney, so wherever you are in the world, in Sydney it's going to be 1.30, uh, the same time we started today, so wherever that is, wherever you guys, uh, guys and girls are. Um, but yeah, so what are we going to cover tomorrow? All right, so uh, again, full disclosure, I'll, I'll go home and like finish this properly. You're going to do a couple of little things in this step? Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be exactly the same steps that I showed you guys right now, mm -hmm. but just a little bit more time on. Mm. And then tomorrow we're going to look at shading and special effects and then composing the image so that we can kind of potentially output this as a print or whatever. Yeah. All right. So it goes from just something that sits on your computer to being something that's outputable to the world. Right. Um, and has, I guess, for lack of a better word. And like lighting, lighting as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So lighting, shading, kind of you know, neon glows and all that kind of jazz and then kind of composing the image and locking it all up. Super cool. Yeah. It's very exciting. Um, so, yeah, so thank thank you all. If you do have any any other questions, um, yeah, I guess we'll be back. Yep. Um, that's a pretty that's a pretty solid effort. Um, and thanks to everyone in the chat. Thanks for Festus um, digging up that, um, that video by Paul Tranny. We're going to check that out for sure. I'm super interested in that. Um, thank you all for jumping in. We're actually going to be back in about five or six minutes um, to con continue our day of illustration. We're going to be playing around with Fresco uh, Lunar New Year inspired illustration by the amazing Bill Hope. Uh, yeah, this time we're going to be, that, yeah, it's going to be super cool. We haven't had Bill on for quite a while. Uh, he's an amazing illustrator. Um, we're also going to be drawing something from scratch. So um, really can't wait to see what he does. Um, and we'll be using Fresco as well, which we talked a little bit about a little bit yeah, about today. Did. Yep. Um, so, so if you're keen for that, please stick around, um, just stay in chat and, uh, we will see you soon. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And, um, thanks for all the comments and questions and we'll see you guys tomorrow. See you sure. tomorrow. See you soon.